from the islands. Okay. So That's once cool. it's live, I'll uh, broadcast. Oh, there you go. All right, so you see my slide. I just got to check, because I'm going to, during the thing, because we're going to do some sort of uh, writing, some activity um, with it. But you can okay. see me. I none of my stuff yes. is working. Yes, it's uh, the, you're screen sharing now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let me just. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, now I see you guys. Now I, I I don't I honestly have to admit I don't know if I have two hours. I, I mean, this is like unless well, they have uh, like questions. Yeah, they they will have questions for sure. Okay. It's okay. a yeah. one one and a half. One and what, a half. Okay. Yeah, so. Yeah. So uh, I'll start the broadcast now so that they can uh, come in. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. So. That'll be good. I'm just. So um, let's. So you want to share screen now, or because uh, I want to introduce you first. Yeah. Is it not sharing right now? Yeah, it's it, it's sharing because uh, I want to share first your information to all. Oh yeah, you can. Well, I don't know why my computer is it's, so slow today. But so yeah, see on the on the first slide I have, um, yeah, all, it, it's all there too. Uh, uh, yeah, we're good. We're good. All right, let's see. It just seems to be really slow. But everything else going all right? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, they're starting to come in. So we're actually okay. live right now. So most coaches are trickling in. Uh, Teddy will join us. Teddy is a sports psychologist, so it's a oh, good. very good uh, resource person also, since uh, this is a uh, a mental approach. So yeah, the game. Now, is my is is are, are, is my sharing my screen? Uh, is it is it the whole screen, the first slide, or do you see everything else on the side? I, st I see everything else on the side. You have to play it. Yeah, I know. It's not, it's, I'm having a little issues with it this morning and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's all good. It's, it, it's right in the middle, so. Yeah, but it's loading. I'm going to have to force quit this one here for a second. And then. You know, it never works when you want it to work correctly. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay, we're live uh, again. We're uh, with uh, Coach Hernando Penel. He's Filipino American. For those who doesn't know him, uh, so he's gonna talk about the mental game. Uh, so, how much Filipino do you know, Coach? You know, I, uh, I, when, I'm, when I go back home, I call Philippines my home because I was raised on the Filipino side. Um, I pick it up really quickly. I know all the bad words because my mom used to yell at me all the time. Um, <laughs> so I won't, I won't repeat any of it, but uh, I was yelled at a lot. Um, so, so yeah, she, uh, <laughs> so I know all those words and I still go back because I have, um, I have, they're all together as 10 of us. My mom had 10 kids. And I have uh, seven of them living in Manila. So I go back uh, a good amount of time and, and spend time with them and, and see family. All right. All right. So, yeah, uh, his information is uh, on the screen right now for those who want to, you know, reach out to uh, Coach Hernando. Of course, he's the under-17 coach of uh, the New Zealand national team. He was uh, also an associate head coach with the women's program of Duke University. And uh, we've connected uh, through the years, over the years. And uh, when uh, we were both together in uh, Vegas for the uh, NBA Summer League. And uh, of course, uh, fellow Filipino uh, uh, coach, you can start uh, sharing first your journey. At, uh, yeah. Oh, on your coaching journey, and then you go. To, you can go through your presentation. Sure, absolutely. I'm actually having a little problem with that presentation. It seems to be loading, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely. Um, I'll, you know, on the screen, you should be able to see. You know, my 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 name, my my telephone number, which that number also goes to my WhatsApp. Um, mm -hmm. That's my email address uh, as well too, and then all my different social medias um, that are on there. Hold on a second, guys. Bear with me, I apologize. Okay, I think, 
maybe we're okay. But anyways, so this is all of my different information. You know, feel free to reach out to me on, on all the different uh, social media outlets and, and everything else. And I've had a, uh, a very different coaching career. I think like all of us, we've all had, you know, all our different opportunities and, and our ups and downs and everything else. So I, I've, I've been very blessed to have coached at every single level. So I've, I've coached at the youth level. I've coached at the high school level in Los Angeles where I grew up. I grew up at, I coach at the junior college level. Um, I could coach at the professional league. I coach in three different professional leagues in the United States, including, you know, the NBA uh, G League. I was with the Boston Celtics with them. Um, and then I've coached in the pro leagues in, in Japan. Uh, and actually for a time, I was the basketball consultant for UE uh, right there in uh, Recto where I lived. And, and I was there for about five or six months working with them. And and then, and then the last seven years, uh, I spent time as one of the, uh, well, I was the associate head women's basketball coach at Duke University. Um, mm -hmm. So, and it was my, my first women's job. So I coached men, uh, the early part of my career in the last seven years, um, I had coached uh, women. So it was, you know, when you're going through your coaching journey, you're able to, to see how it is to coach men and women, that there is a difference, but at the end of the day, they all want to be coached. They all want to be led with everything. And that's, that's sort of my basketball journey. Oh, I'm sorry, and I forgot. And on top of that, now I serve as the uh, junior national team coach for New Zealand uh, on the women's side. So I go to New Zealand about two or three times a year. Um, you know, we were supposed to play in the FIBA Asia Championship in October, but we have no idea if that's going to happen uh, because of, of what's going on with everything else. So. So that is, is so where we are. And that's my, my basketball career. So I've been everywhere. I've seen different levels and everything. On the other side of it, um, I've also worked with a lot of actors uh, on different movies. So I will choreograph uh, basketball and movies. If you saw Coach Carter, mm -hmm. uh, if you saw Longest Yard, Spider-Man 3, uh, all these different. So how all of this came together is that I uh, saw that basketball players are athletes and actors all prepare the same way, right? They prepare the same way. There's a practice for our players. There's rehearsal uh, for the actors. There is the game for our players. There is the, the performance, the TV show, the film for our actors. And everybody gets critiqued at the end. They are, you know, told what they did or didn't do right. So, you know, we do that with our players. And then of course we do it uh, also, actors do it with the media and their acting coach, et cetera. So, it really came down to that. It really came down to what makes high performing people do well, right? When you watch TV, when you watch games, you see these players who are so clutch. They're able to go ahead and make shots and score at will and do all these different things, right? But there are so many other players who go in the gym, who take 200 shots, who take 500 shots, but it never gets uh, related to the game time, right? I think as coaches, and, and all of you have seen it, your player gets a wide open look, gets a wide open shot, catches the ball, and he shoots it, and he misses. He misses the shot, she misses the shot, and what do we say as coaches? We tell them, bend your legs, follow through, all these coaching things. The, but the other part is that our athlete, when they catch the ball, they are not in the moment. Meaning, they catch the ball, and all of a sudden, they're thinking, oh my gosh, I'm open, I'm gonna make a shot, right? They're thinking, I better make this shot. They're thinking, oh, my teammate was open, maybe I should. So all these thoughts are getting in the way for them transferring what they did uh, in practice and shoot around to then the game. So how are we able to do it? And I would love to show you the slides, but right now it's not working. So hold on, uh, let me stop sharing. Yeah, uh, stop sharing and then share from the, from uh, which screen to share? From the PowerPoint or there? Stop sharing, because that's, it seems to be loading. But anyway, so that's sort of how, how everything, I'm gonna let it sit for a little bit. That's right. how everything comes, comes together. And when I saw the different ways, and as you know, coaching at different levels are all different, right? So there's, when you coach at the youth level, whether you coach at the high school level, college, and professional. And since I was able to coach all of them, I saw a difference in coaching. At the, the professional level, 
there is a little bit more calmness by the coaches, meaning, you know, there's a little more, there's more teaching, there's more collaboration, there's more connection. When you go to U.S. colleges, there are a lot more screaming. There's a lot more, I, coaches would call it demanding, but there is, and, and I heard Coach Preston speak earlier about, you know, a demeaning part of it, that he does not demean his players, which is a huge, huge part. You know, so when you're talking about mind, your mind, and you're talking about culture with your program, those are things um, that can definitely get in the way and hurt with what's going on. So let's, let me open this up again, guys. I apologize for what is going on. I really don't understand why we're having some issues, but that's okay, because we're going to get this done. In the meantime, you know, over the course of this presentation, if you have any uh, questions, uh, feel free right away to, to ask whether it's on your coaching journey, whether it's how we're going to go ahead and, uh, and go through the, the mental part of it. And nothing is loading, Ariel. This is, this is a little uh, so frustrating here, guys. Just give me a second. <laughs> I got it. Eric, Coach, sorry, guys. Coach, what are the chances if I log off and log back on? Are you okay with that? Okay. Can't hear me, Teddy. You're good. There. Yeah. There you go. Much better. Okay, we're just uh, waiting. Sorry about that. I uh, my 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 connection got unstable, so I got the. Uh, I think maybe mine too. Session. That's why coach had a difficult time. But uh, yeah, he'll be right back. So yeah, Teddy. Since I'm, this is uh, this is about mental, so you can. You know, Coach um, Hernando has a unique position here because uh, his, he has a, I assume he has a book, right? The, on the mental game, strengthening yes. our athletes' minds. Mm -hmm. So I have not, personally, I have not read the book yet, but uh, he's able to incorporate a lot of um, his mental techniques since he's been able to handle teams in the past, like the, the Duke's women's team. And... Um, his teams, his junior teams in New Zealand. So it'll be very interesting to hear his take on, on that because it's it's not only going to be X's and O's, but uh, of course, you know, the game within the game. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to wait. Uh, uh, he's, yeah, he's having a bit of difficulty connecting. Uh, he's almost back. He's back. He he's back. Oh, there you go. I think... I'm back, guys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, that, sorry that, that, about that. That's also good that uh, because uh, our attendees uh, just trickled in also. So we're good. We're good. All right, good. Now, see, I got so nervous that I'm, I'm, I'm sweating all over the place. I feel like I'm back <laughs> in the Philippines like everywhere. Uh -huh. And I got I to get in there. All right, so let, all right, so, so let's go back to see if I can share the screen. Please work. And there you go. Boom. Boom. We're good. Oh, woo. All right. So as I was All talking, right. hopefully, are we good? We're just going to keep going? 
Yeah, yeah, go on, go all on. Right. It's your, your floor. So again, this is all the information. Just a little bit more about me so you can take a look at it right there, what you see. I have my I have kids. I know I look very young. It's because I'm half Filipino. That's the reason why I look very young. So anyways, <laughs> on the top side are my kids. I have my son, his name is Preston, which is hilarious because the other coach was Preston. Uh, my son is 19 years old. He is a swimmer at the University of Iowa. Um, I have a daughter, 16. She sings and dances. She used to play basketball and was like, Dad, I don't want to play basketball anymore. I said, great. Um, next to that are some <laughs> of my brothers and sisters. I think, like I mentioned, I've got 10 of them. I mean, no, there's 10 of us. I'm number nine. Um, and Ten. then sort of below my... Yeah, my brother You're Filipino. Is, uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 is, uh, <laughs> So they, they so it's easy. They they just call me either junior or number nine. That's that's how we know right. who I am on the pecking order. And then the picture below that is number ten, my sister Pilar. And then my mom, my mom would kill me if I shared this picture of her. But she, <laughs> my mom, is now being shown right there. And the bottom is some of the movies that I've been able to work with, as I kind of share with all of you in terms of working with the different movies and my time at Duke, the D League basketball, New Zealand, and now of course, working with athletes and teams and organizations on how to really be a high performing uh, individual and not just at work or on their sport, but also at home in their personal life um, as well too, which is extremely important. Um, oh, wait. Great stuff. Oh, that's the same slide. So this is one of my favorite quotes and this goes on to what we talked about. This is Mia Hamm. Mia Hamm is a famous, uh, women's soccer player, USA basketball player, and her quote, one of my favorite quotes is, I'm building a fire, and every day I train, I add more fuel. Um, at just the right moment, I light the match, right? So a lot of coaches say this, right? We say, hey, when you go to practice, you, we're, we're putting fire. We're building ourselves for us to be better. And like we mentioned, when you miss those shots, when you don't perform at a high level, right? Sometimes you train, you train, and you coaches train your players, and then – when it comes game time, when this, what the quote says, at just the right moment, I light the match. How many of you coaches are trying to light the match of your players and there's no fire? There's nothing going on with the player because they're not able to transfer what they're doing in practice to the game. So this is one of the things that we talked about and that we really are working on uh, to work with our players right here. It's, it's really the mental game. And there's three parts to the mental game. And, and coaches, I'll be happy to share this with you anytime. If you shoot me an email or whatever you need. And again, my, my email is on the bottom of the screen. But the mental game, there are three things that come with it. It's confronting our self-limiting beliefs and perception. You see, as we are growing up, we are told no so many times, right? So you're three years old, you're four years old. They tell you, no, don't touch that. Mom tells you, no, you know, for me, it was always, Junior, stop that all the time. She would say that to me all the time. And, and so I grew up like, well, maybe I shouldn't. And the other part is this, and I don't know how many coaches or the people are on here who, who are part of this as well too, but your parents want to protect you. So they say things to you like, oh, get a safe job, get a career, you go to school, you go to college. You, so, so they're teaching you how to do it when in fact, and they don't even know it, they are putting self, they're putting limiting beliefs on you, all right? So these are things that we are constantly trying to break free and your players are trying to break free from that. The second part is breaking cycles in your life once and for all. Have any of you gone through a hard time in your life and you say to yourself, okay, it's gonna be better, and then tomorrow it happens again, or the next week it happens again, right? We do this in our relationships. We do this in our training. We do this in every facet, every part of our life. That's what we do. So how do we break the cycles? And for some, they're called generational curses. How do you break through everything to get through? And that's a big part of the mental game. And that's how, what we have to teach our players how to get through. It's more than just telling your players, hey, you can do it hey, I believe in you. It's much more than that. That is just part of the process, which as coaches, that's how far we usually go because we're not trained as much on how to see things mentally. And the, other, the third part is understanding the power of stretching your thinking, okay? So a perfect example 
uh, in Spain. I spent about one, well, about two months in Spain altogether, going to different club teams, watching practice, talking to their players, talking to coaches on how they approach things. In a lot of countries, they coach and train basketball with hard fundamentals. You're going to jump stop. You're going to make a pass. All these different things. Well, in a lot of Spanish clubs, about 15 to 20 minutes, they devote to creativity. Meaning, if they're doing a layup, do it with different hands. Go off another foot. Do some different reverses. Now, don't throw things off, you know, behind your back. Now, that's a little extreme. But what it does, it gives the players the confidence to be creative in that part so that now when it comes game time, they can now access it. Because if you watch Spanish-style basketball, right, very similar to uh, Philippine basketball, wide open, running around, fast-breaking, exciting brand of basketball, and, P and different teams and programs are known for it. So those are the three things that we look at when we are attacking the mental game and how we are going to get better and what do we need our players. These are three definite things that are in all of your players. In fact, these are three different things that are all in your players, all in your coaches, all in your coworkers, all in your partner, all in your parents. We all have it. So breaking through them is a big part of what we're trying to do today. Watch this video from me here. This is a, a, a video from England. Uh, it's about a rowing team, how they use different things to perform at a high level. Oh, wait, sorry, went the wrong way. Oh no, there we go. Raising the bar one year to the next. The annual boat race between Oxford and Cambridge universities is one of the oldest and most prestigious events in the sporting calendar. Moving out to nearly half a length there, it's very encouraging for Cambridge. For the competitors, it's 20 minutes of pure pain. Also, pure pressure. When they walk out of that boathouse, there will be 100,000 people standing on the bank. That is something you just can't get your head around until you actually lift it. How the rowers cope with that intense pressure can make the difference between glory and failure. The Cambridge women's team have won the last two races, and this woman has been one of the secrets of the success. So I work on managing their thinking, knowing that they are in control of their psychological state. Sport psychologist Helen Davis has worked on specific techniques to help the team at the most mentally testing moments in the race. When the pain kicks in, they have trigger words that they've planned for in advance that they will say to themselves to get across the finish line. As training for the 2019 race intensifies, just trying to keep up with teammates is mentally grueling. Trying to make those crews is huge pressure. I get off the water and I've just been trying to keep up with people who compete at world championships. And then I work on my PhD and I'm trying to keep up with people that I feel are so much smarter than me. So it's pressure that I put on myself. So I will very much encourage them to view pressure as a challenge. Focus on certain things with their thinking that's going to help them with their performance rather than focusing on the uncertainties of their situation. All right. So thought that was a great video to share with you. Now, notice a couple of things. Now, one of the th things I, I showed this video before to a, uh, a basketball program and they said, coach or H, they all call me H, H. You showed us a video on rowing. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have ever rowed. It is one of the most physical taxing sport. But the other part of it is, is that it's also one of the ultimate team sports. Because if one person isn't rowing correctly, or one person is tired, or one person, person isn't mentally there, then the boat starts going like back, you know, zigzagging, and they're no longer going in, in a straight line. And that boat race specifically, the Cambridge one versus Oxford, is, is huge all over Europe. People come all over the place. Now, a couple of things that she said that I just wanted to touch on, she talked about managing thinking. So when you are working with your team, your players, whoever else, what are you doing to manage their thinking, okay? Now that's a huge part. Now you're not controlling their thinking, but you're managing, you're teaching them how to think, how to see things in a really clear way. She talked about trigger words, which we will uh, go through later on on this presentation, but also that pressure 
as a challenge, okay? When you go through your team, you are taking a look at the players who can thrive under pressure. You have to have a notebook. You have to write down who are the people that you know can get the ball. And then you have to train them in a way so that they're able to go ahead and transcend everything and then be able to do it. So pressure as a challenge. So when you're thinking of your practices, and, and I, when I call practices, I'm practices, individual meetings, team meetings, what are you doing to challenge the way they think every single time without even them knowing? Like you don't, you can challenge them in, in different ways that isn't really just right up in their face because you want to be at different levels. So I, hopefully you got something with that video. So what we do is we do, we do different mind workouts. These are the three different mind workouts that I believe that are, uh, should be, could be a very important part of your program. We have mind mapping um, on the top there. That's myself, my daughter. I had a chance to work with Adam Sandler on mind mapping um, a few times. And I worked on a few projects. And that's where I actually learned the mind mapping part from him and his, his people on how you take your mind, map it out so you have your mission. I don't use the word goals. The word mission, I use the word mission on how, what's our mission moving forward. Um, you see LeBron James with his eyes closed. No, he is not sleeping. That is an actual part where he is meditating, visualizing in a game when he was with the Miami Heat and they were able to catch him right then and there. And the bottom is trigger words. Of course, I have the rowing team. These are trigger words that anytime you use a trigger word, you're able to reset your mind and then now start performing at a great level. So we're going to talk first about mind mapping. This is this screen right here is how most of us look at information. This talks about mind mapping and we have different quotes. We have different things all over the screen. But if we're going to talk about mind mapping, we might as well show what a mind map looks like with the same screen. This is a screen of what a mind map looks like on the information I just showed in the previous screen. So when you look at it, your central part, the middle part is your central goal. And for this, it was mind mapping. If I'm able to pull up on screen, we may just end up doing one um, on, uh, on my iPad. But when you have the central screen and now you have all the different arrows on what mind mapping does. So if you look at mind mapping, you look directly above, it says ignites creativity, okay? And then above ignites creativity is sort out your thoughts. So when you're mind mapping and you're igniting creativity, what comes with igniting creativity? Sorting out our thoughts so then we could come back and be creative. The same thing with meaning, meaningful learning. It's on one of the sites. In order to have meaningful learning, you need to connect that new knowledge to the knowledge that you already have. And mean, meaningful learning is something that you have to do in coaching because you're taking prior drills, past drills, and then implementing to the system that you have today. So I'm going to go ahead. Let's see if I can attempt. I don't think I'm going to be attempt to, to share my other screen. So bear with me, everybody. Hopefully we don't lose anything. <laughs> Coach, Coach H, I have a question. Yes. So for mind mapping, um, how long does it take somebody to do it regularly before it becomes uh, second nature for them? In my, in my experience, uh, I've, had, I've had some people try it, but when the people around them don't see it the same way, then it becomes a challenge to continue to do it because when, when somebody sees something that is out of the ordinary or it's not normally done, then there's usually a lot of uh, uh, negativity. No, not exactly negativity. It's uh, resistance. Resistance yes. to it. <laughs> so, so mind mapping is something that is evolutionary. It is something that will, it is the best practice is to constantly grow from it. So, and, and mind mapping should happen uh, with an individual player, but then also with the team concept um, as well too. So right now on the screen, I think you have a screen, you have a blank screen and, and I'll show you a little bit. So let's say, and that's a great question by the way, and we'll touch on it even more with, with this right here. So let's say our mission is to go ahead and I'm sorry, I have horrible penmanship. All right, so let's say our mission is to win championships. Okay, so how mind map works, you start right there in the beginning 
and you put a nice little square on it. You could, you know, put a little line. You could be artistic if you want, whatever. So when you talk to your team and you say, okay, if our mission is championships, how are we going to get there? Number one, that's our how is the question that we're asking. And where are these championships, right? Right, so, um, and, it, and it depends. Uh, in the US college system, there's you know, a league champion or there's a tournament championship, conference championship, uh, national championship. In the Philippines, I know there's, you know, in the, in the, in the, in, if you're in the UAAP, it's, you have Phil Oil, you have the UAP, and then you have all these different tournaments or the NCAA, you have all these different pocket tournaments over the year. So you, as the coach, define what championships is. All right, so the first part is we're gonna tackle the how. All right, we're gonna tackle the how right here. And how it works is that you just go, you put a line, and how are we gonna get there? And usually it starts off with training, right? So training would be there. Maybe you wanna put down mindset. Maybe you wanna put down culture, okay? So those are, are, let's just go with those three with the training, right? So in order to have a championships, our training has to be really good. So what does that look like? That means we have to have high level, all right? And by the way, as a coach, you're not the one coming up with all this. Your players are the one. So you sit them down and you let them start talking about what the training looks like. So you, have a brain, you have a brainstorming session. Yeah, it's players. pretty much brainstorming. But the, but, but the thing, what I found with coaches is that during this session, we, we grow all of this, but we never come back to it, right? We, we, we never come back to it, which is a really, really tough thing to do. Um, now, the, the reason why I like this and, the reason, and one of the things that was work out, and I, I like bringing this up because as, as I mentioned earlier, ha having a chance to work with Adam Sandler, you, you see how his mind works. Um, and you have to have some sort of organization in your head. If you look at yourself as a coach, when I look at myself as a coach, no one taught me how to organize my thoughts. No one taught me, they would tell me, well, just have a notebook and have a notebook and just keep writing on a notebook. Well, coaches, I don't know about you, I have like a hundred notebooks that I haven't opened in such a long time. So I'm not organizing my thoughts. All I'm being is a great note taker. So do, having mind mapping does a few things. It helps you get organized. It helps get your players organized. And as the, the length of the season goes on, you always come back to the mind map. But the other part is this. This is such a, a, a small paper I have, but what you end up seeing is maybe in the first part of the season, this is how big your mind map begins. Second part of the season, this is how big. You go to the third, I mean, all of a sudden, you're going to have topics and people talking about it that gets bigger and bigger. Why? Because coaching is evolutionary. Coaching always continues to grow. So if you don't grow your mind map, then what happens? It dies. And your vision and your culture that you're putting in place doesn't it doesn't grow. And it's the same thing with individual players, right? If we have an individual player and let's say, you know, whatever they want to do, maybe, maybe their mission is to go ahead and let's just say the leading score, right? I'm a scorer. Great. Okay. Well, the same thing. What are we going to do? What are the things that you have to do that you have to go be in the score? I have to get in the gym. I have to focus. I have to have fundamentals. Again, is, is it, uh, coach, is it recommended that within the coaching staff first, they'll implement the mind mapping before introducing it to the players? Yes. I, I, yeah, that, that, uh, that's a great point. Absolutely. I think it's really, really important to go ahead and do it with your, with your group first, with your coaches first, so that you are able to go in and get some good practice um, and then grow from it. You see, as a coaching staff, yes, you have a, a mission and a goal and a foundation, but you must also remember that, that in the way the world works, in the way that people work, when you collaborate with your team, performance goes higher. Uh, that's the collaboration, that's the connection effect that 
as coaches, some of us aren't used to. We're used to controlling everything. So this is a way to definitely work with your staff on what they see, what they what is the goals, what, I'm sorry, the mission, what they believe the team could go for, and then you you go from there. And it's constantly looking at your mind. Like every day, you look at your mind map, and you're like, all right, well, what else can we add to it? And again, like I said, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but but you have to carry it. Like you got you got to have it with you. You can't just do it one time and then think like, all right, we're good. We have mapped our success um, with it. So hopefully that helped uh, with it. Um, all right. Any questions on the mind mapping? Um, no questions yet. These are all mine for me. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> so love I, it. I, yeah, this is so great. I have better uh, understanding. Bec no, this uh, is having worked with with some teams in in Manila. Um, they're they're they only have a short amount of time together, you know, mm -hmm. every day for practice. So. If they were to do something like this in a structured setting, this would probably be in place of one practice session. And uh, so in, in my mind, I'm trying to formulate how, how it can be feasible for our coaches because um, not, well, some of them are, are in different levels. So they might have more time with their players than, than other coaches, but you want to maximize the time. So I'm, I'm thinking based on your structure, mind map first with the coaches, then when you, when you got that down, have a general session with all the players. You have a big board to write down all you know, what they want, uh, what they think um, is part of the big uh, mission or goal. And then individually, they can do it themselves when they've learned how to, how to mind map. And that's the one that continually grows. Maybe they can be in their notebook. Or, I don't know if that will work, but uh, that's how I formulate in my mind and how this can be very helpful for them. Yes. And, and that's definitely a one way to do it. Another way would be, let's say right here, I have day one, day two, day three, day four, right? So on day one, and, and, and I understand the, the, the lack of practice time and everything. So on day one, what you could do is before practice or after practice. And this is after you and the coaches and the coaches have gotten together and, and talked about that session. That, let's say you've moved on to your player. So on day, like we're gonna call it day one. On day one, all the players, you know, you every coach talks to their players either before or after practice. And you sit there and say, okay, I want, you know, one coach has a pen and I need one word on how we're going to win the championship, let's just say. So you go down the line and maybe some people say the same word, but then you take about four words, let's just say four words, you know, from championships, all right? So, and that's the first day. So what, what you're doing as well too, is that you're easing them into it, right? So you're just talking in front, give me you know, word, what do you have? What do you have? What do you have? Great, we write it down, great. Day two, all right, day two, and maybe you do half the team day one. This way it takes five minutes. Day two, maybe you do the other half of the team, whether you have 15 players or 30 players. I know when I was at UE, we'd show, we'd have like 45 players during workouts. And I'm like, we have two baskets. What are we doing 45 players? But that's another discussion. But when we go ahead, so day two would be another four words, let's say. All right. So now day three, and again, this is five to 10 minutes. This is just the progressive part of it, because then what we're also doing, we are working out their mind muscles to get used to us having actual uh, intentional words that help us after practice. Because I've noticed that us coaches, we say the same thing before and after practice. Let's work hard. Let's be together. Let's focus. And then we say the after practice, after practice, we say things such as, did we focus? We didn't look focused. Did we work hard? We didn't work hard. So it's the same words. Whereas if we flex their muscle minds and now on day three, maybe we have, we start the board. Maybe we have a little board and then right there, we have our championship in the middle. And then you end up having the eight words that's not eight. Anyways, you end up having eight words right there that now you are showing how it's going to be formulated. And then day four, and then you could have one day where you spend maybe 30 minutes to, to go through it. So I think you can be very um, creative on how you want to approach this. I think the hard part though, Teddy, is that if when coaches try and do everything in one day, because you'll, you'll lose your players after like 20 minutes, right? It'll be like, okay. I, I'm I tired of um, 
So, Coach, Coach that, H, we have two questions from uh, uh, our participants. Uh, yes. Coach Bong, Coach Bong is asking, how do you squeeze the mind mapping sessions in with the regular team and player preparations? Mm -hmm. um, so squeezing them in is, is really trying to take about five minutes a day, it's sort of like we mentioned, the, breaking it down at a, at a micro level. Um, so the four words, the four words, and again, it could be four to six to eight. You have to take a look at your team and see what is really best for it. So by doing it, you know, five minutes here, five minutes there, maybe a, a 15 minute session, because honestly, uh, these sessions, should, it, it's hard for them to go longer than 15 minutes. You're, you're going to lose your players, whether it's before practice or after practice. When you are talking about mind mapping, and now what happens is those eight words that you have in the beginning part of the championship part, those are words now that you can say on a regular basis. So when you are using those words on a regular basis, you are actually growing the mind map in your players' heads because they will say, you know what, coach just said that to me the other day. Um, I, saw, I heard coach say that in practice, right? And then you're able to expand on the different things that come from those eight words. Thanks, coach. Uh, Ethel has a question. Hi, coach. Is mind mapping the same as goal setting? Thank you. Um, it is a part of, of setting your mission or your goals. Uh, why is it a part is because, for example, when I work with players, I would say, okay, what is your mission? What is your goal? Well, I, I want to lead the league in scoring. Okay. Well, how are you going to do it? Well, I'm going to keep working out. I'm going to shoot. I'm going to just be ready. Like when you talk to your players, they don't have a map on how they are going to get from A to B. So by doing this, yes, we are talking about goals and our mission, but we are also giving our players a clear map on what it will take for them to reach the level that they want to get to. I hope that helps. So using your example about leading the league and scoring, if I was a player, I'd have to, I'd have to be more specific. Something like, um, I have to work on my game to get myself to the foul line, have more attempts in the foul line, have to get stronger so that I can mix it up underneath, get an easy basket, that, that kind of thing that we're going to put in right, my so, Right, so, so, so you're breaking it down. So for example, let's, and that, that's a great one. Um, where is this? So let's say you have a player that can score, but doesn't score during the games. Okay, says so like, yeah, I, you know, you, you watch them practice, they do a great job. So mind mapping for them. So let's say, so for him or her, it could be more specific. I want to score 12 points. That's where you start with your mind. Okay, so how are we going to do it? Well, there's shooting, right? Shots, um, there's free throws, um, there's transition. Okay, so now where are we going to get our shots from? What kind of shooter am I? Well, I'm a mid-range. All right, so we got to get to the mid-range. All right, free throw line. Okay, how many? Transition. Okay, with defense. So now, when you go back up to shots, mid-range, how many mid-range? If we got to get to 12, how many mid-range shots you got to hit? Well, if I don't go to free throws or transition, I've got to be able to hit six. All right, so that's six. Now, but what if I go ahead and you have to always have the what if because you have to manage expectations and also manage your mind. So let's say, what if I just only hit three? Then what do I do? So you go down to free throws. And now this ties in to how many. So if you hit three shots, three times two is six. So you got to get to 12. So it's either six free throws. Or what if I go to three free throws? And I'm sorry, it's so messy. You usually have a bigger piece of paper. All right, so now if it's three free throws, then we go to transition. How many transition baskets you need? Oh, okay, we need maybe one or two. So now, boom, I need two baskets in transition in order to get my 12. You see, when you do that, you are now breaking it down at a micro level. So now your player sees, oh, I can do this. What we do as coaches, we say, well, 12 points are easy. Just get into the lane, you know, draw a foul, all those things. But if your players don't see it, if they don't have a map for it, they will have a hard time translating that back to the court. 
Coach, the questions are coming in. For, yes. Uh, yes. Love okay. it. From Jakob, uh, from the KL Dragons in, in uh, oh. the ABL. Yeah. How are you doing, Jakob? So it's the, been a long time since I saw you. So he's the general manager. He's asking, how do you continue to get the buy-in on this, meaning the for the for the mind mapping from the players when things don't go so well in the season? That's his question. Right. So so when you have this mind mapping and and you have the buy-in, and this goes with the meditation, the visualization, and the trigger words, um, all of the stuff that we're talking is that you've got to be really close to your captain slash leaders of the team. Like they're going to be the one driving everything. So as a coach, you have to have those relationships with those players um, who have a clear understanding of what's going on. What I find, find is that um, leaders who aren't necessarily your best players or best scorers are the ones that do a great job of bringing together. And how do you find those leaders? Well, you find the leaders. If you have a player that does a great job of bringing everybody to a party, that's a leader. Their person of influence. So your person of influence um, has a greater chance. And it's like with any culture, when you become a player led team, then you start being very successful. So when your players start buying into this and it does take time for your players to buy into it. Don't, don't get me wrong. It does take time, but just like any parent, if you tell them and you tell them you plant seeds, it starts growing. So your coach has to, of course, bought, be bought in. Then they have to talk to your leaders and your captains um, and them being bought in and then they're the ones who are spreading the message over time and if you don't have anybody who is spreading your message and you don't have any leaders or captain then maybe you have to take a look at the coaches and coaching staff coach from jc we have a question is mind mapping could it also be considered a strategic planning yes and 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 you could use any term you want from strategic planning um, is a, another word for it. What I found in strategic planning that there's a lot of words. Strategic planning to me, when I think about that, it's a lot of paragraphs. Um, it is maybe a nice header. You know, this is where we're going to go, and then a paragraph of words. Uh, for me, based on on what I see as players today, they need little bits of information. So less is more in many ways. Um, so when, when they see something like this, now, again, not all your players will love this. Not all, all your players will think that we're just drawing circles and arrows, right? But when you see, when they see the results from it, because you as coaches are being very specific with this and are following through, then, then the buy-in occurs. But yes, to answer your question, it is very much the same slash similar as strategic plan. Thanks, coach. Uh, please continue with your presentation. Thanks. All right. Heading back here, wherever I could find it. Um, uh oh, we lost everything again. Wait, oh, and we're back. All right, so that's mind mapping um, with it. Now you could also become very creative with it and put some colors and some, some stick figures if you like with it. It depends if you have time. If you don't have time, don't worry about it. But this is just another uh, thing of what you see with mind mapping. Next part about and we'll move on. And again, you can come back to any question. Meditation and visualization. Huge, huge part of your program and how you work with players. Now, what these two things do, as you can see on the screen, enhance the focus, stress goes down, speed up recovery because you are resting your mind better, which leads to better sleep, which then leads to enhanced endurance. This um, is a, a big part of it. I have a picture of that. That's my son. Um, my son does a lot of meditation and visualization and real quickly, a quick story. Uh, my son was not a big believer in it at all. He would say, dad, why are we doing this? I don't want to do it. So I, I don't force him to do it. He didn't do it. So he started his freshman year as a swimmer. He went from a, a top 100 um, swimmer in the country in high school to now he goes to college and everybody is good. Everybody's bigger. He's, he just wasn't as good. So he goes half the year doing okay. In January, he calls me and says, all right, Dad, this is his exact words. He said, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cuss a little bit. He goes, Dad, I'm like, yeah, Preston, can we do all that meditation shit you always talk about? That's what my son said to me. The nerve of him. He says that. That's his dad. But I said, all right. I was very happy. So he was at a hotel. They were going to play Notre Dame. 
I'm swimming against Notre Dame. He sat there, we did the meditation and we visualized uh, the meat and everything else that he needed to do in order for him to do well. He did that in January. By the time March hit in the championship for the Big Ten championships, the conference is the Big Ten, uh, on the day of the championship meets, in the morning they have where you have to do uh, get your time trial to see if you get to the championship meet at the, uh, at the end of the day. He did the exact same thing, had his routine, got in the pool. He increased, oh no, he bested his time by four seconds, all right? So he took off four seconds. Now what happened there was it was over a course of time that he, his focus was better, his anxiety or stress was lower, he got better rest, and then that day he peaked at the right time to make, as a freshman, a Big Ten championship. And, and those are things that what this could really, really help. This is, the last time this is LeBron, out. watch played him. played the entire game. He would have played the entire game in game six if it wasn't a blowout. Boom. That's so quick, right? Ten seconds. If that, ten seconds is all you need. Now, you can go deeper and further. And, of course, ten seconds is something you could do either in the beginning or in the end. But what LeBron was doing, he was calming his mind. He was getting all the noise out of everything. When I was the consultant for UE, we played in the fill oil. And that was my first time I've, I'd ever gone to a college basketball game in the Philippines. I'm there, I'm excited. The game begins and you can't hear any coaching. You hear people playing drums, they're yelling, they're screaming. I mean, chants all over the place. And I'm watching this because one of my jobs was to talk to the coaches and see what they could do to help them and I'm watching this and no one can say anything because your players can't hear you there's so much noise so imagine if, if as a coach you're yelling and they can't hear you imagine what the players are their focus is all over the place because they're listening to the very good looking girl in the stands or the guy in the stands they're they're mad because they got fouled wrong all these things on how they're not being able to focus with it so what LeBron was doing, he was calming his mind so that he can go ahead and make shots and perform at a high level. These are just three high level people. That's Russell Wilson, he's a, a football player. They do imagery work. Um, the second part we have volleyball and of course LeBron is in. These are just different quotes on why imagery, meditation, visualization is such a big part. And, and we're gonna go through it a little bit on, on the next one. On, I think it's on the next slide on what to do and how to do it with your team. Um, so here, this is what people believe what meditation is. And, and on, on the top side is where you wear a beanie. You, have, you know, you're sitting in a stance, you have your fingers like this and you're just chanting, right? But that's, that's not meditation, right? If you, there are three other examples you can see on the bottom. That's the Ateneo volleyball team. Um, they go ahead and did it. This is in match that they went ahead and was do meditation. You have Boston College and you have a kid's camp. Now, when I want to talk about meditation, I'm not talking about 20, 30 minutes. I'm talking about taking a time of solitude, whether you start at 10 seconds, 20 seconds, a minute, whatever else it is, where you close your eyes, you take deep breaths. Now, when you take deep breaths, the formula is four, two, four. All right, and that's a great thing for a beginner. That's four breaths in, two breaths hold, four breaths out and you do it over and over and over again. Now, for some, I know some teams who do six, one, six, people do three, two, three, whatever it, it works. But what you're doing is that you're calming your mind down so that you're able to feel and sense everything. And the other part of it is that when you're meditating and these are things that you would tell your players and it sounds a little, I don't know, like not real, but, but it is. So you would tell your players, all right, when you breathe in, you're breathing all the positive energy or you're breathing in uh, your faith, you're breathing in and you're blowing out, you're breathing out all the pressures, all the things that are going in your life. So we'll actually do it right now. So do it with me on all of you. All right, close your eyes. All right, just close it. And it won't go very long. We'll close your eyes, but I'm gonna go walk you through this so you get it, all right? So here we go. We're going to close our eyes. On the count of when I get to three, I would like your eyes to be closed, please. And no peeking. All right, here we go. One, two, three. 
close your eyes. Now breathe in, one, two, three, four, hold for one, two, breathe out. One, two, three, four, hold for two, one, two, and breathe in again. And as you're breathing in, I want you to breathe in everything that is happiness and joy in your life and breathing out any stress that you may have from the COVID-19, breathe back in all the good energy. And when you're doing this, relax your shoulders, relax your mind, and make sure you are hearing your breaths through the whole thing. On the count of three, I'd like for you to open your eyes. One, two, and three. Open your eyes. You'll feel a little relaxed. If we went for probably about five to 10 more breaths, uh, you would feel really relaxed. You probably want to take a nap, actually. But I know it's late back home in the Philippines, so you'd probably just go to sleep. But when you do these things, you are calming your mind, as I mentioned. And when you calm your mind, you're now able to feel what is going on and then releasing it. The second part of it is when you enter visualization to it. Now, for a lot of people, visualization means this, and this is for a basketball team. Well, if I think positive and I go ahead and uh, think that I make every single shot, if I visualize that every shot I take goes in, then that's gonna transfer over. And to a certain extent, yes. But doing research before trying to figure out how to get in touch with my players at Duke, um, I came across Bob Bowman, who is a uh, the national swim coach for the United States. Actually, Michael Phelps, if you know Michael Phelps, world-class swimmer, um, won 37 gold medals, I think. And he, what he did with Michael Phelps, he did intentional visualization, which means we are now going to visualize every shot going in, but we're also going to visualize the misses. We're also going to visualize us being fouled on our shot, we're gonna visualize how coach is gonna take us out and we're angry. So that's when you start visualizing the context in the game. The other part of it is that when you start fully visualizing, you start visualizing the course of your day. Meaning when I get to the game, if I get to the game, I visualize getting off the bus or getting out of the car, when I step out of the car, is it really hot? Is it cold? When I go into the gym, is it loud? Is the floor really bouncy? Is it cold? Is it hot? When I touch the basketball, you're visualizing every bit of what is going on. Now that does sound like a lot, don't get me wrong. But if you're in the locker room before a game or even practice and you spend two minutes doing this, then all of a sudden, you're two minutes better, right? You are two minutes better. Now, some of you may be asking, coach, do I do the trigger? No, do I do the mind mapping and then meditation on the same day? You could, but on game days, on practice days, having that one to two minutes of deep breaths and, and breathing in and visualizing something goes a long way. I know coaches who do it before practice. All right. I know coaches who do it in the middle of practice. I know coaches who do it at the end of practice, right? I don't think there's a wrong or right way to do it. I think it depends on what your team will do. I have found that us as coaches, we like to have a routine. We're going to do this at eight o'clock. We're going to do this at 8.15. We're going to do this at 8.20. That's great. But what if it doesn't work for your players, right? What if one player or two players, they don't do well at 8.15? So you don't change everything, but you can accommodate them and understand how they work and how they go ahead and do things. Uh, two years ago in the middle of one of our games at Duke, it was a tough game against North Carolina. You know, it's a big rivalry. Sat there in the huddle um, and my coach was talking to the other coach. My head coach was talking. I was the assistant. I sat down with the team. I said, all right, close your eyes real quickly. This is when the gym is up. Close your eyes. Breathe in. And breathe out. They all did. The whole team, actually, not just the five. They breathe in. They breathe out. They, they did about four or five times, and they, and they came out. We did a visualizing session during halftime. Even when you're angry that your players aren't playing well, you can still visualize 
how it can be better in the second half. Um, so that's a little bit about meditation and visualization on how you could utilize it with your team. Uh, and again, you know, there are different ways uh, to do it. Meditation doesn't mean you're sitting down in silence. Meditation could be a walk. Meditation could you be, you know, I could walk out of my apartment, go downstairs to the laundry room, and I'm in deep thought and deep thinking. And when you meditate, and one more thing, you meditate and visualize, you get into something called the flow state. Now, a flow state is when you do things at a, a high level, but you don't remember how you got there. So, for example, I don't know if it's ever happened to you. Have you ever gotten in a car and you leave work or you leave wherever and then you get to your destination, you park the car and then you say to yourself, how did I get here? I don't even remember me driving. Now, you got into a flow state. The reason why you're in a flow state, because you were going through traffic. You, you were stopping when someone got in the way. You didn't run over anybody, but you were just so much in the zone that you got to your final destination in a great way. It's different when you are driving and you're not paying attention and you may hit someone or you may hit a car or whatever else it is. And then you're like, that's, you're not in the flow state. You are getting in the way of yourself. A lot of our kids do it. A lot of your players do it when they play video games. Have you ever had your players play video games and they're just not even paying attention, but they're making everything on the video game? They're in that flow state. So you're tapping in to that flow state, that meditation visualizing so that they're able to be in the moment where they need to be. Uh, another good yeah. example. Yeah. I have an example. Okay. What's uh, that? Um, I have an example. Uh, yes. It might, it might be best to, to there, there is a, there's a book. Um, I have to get back to everybody on the title, but it's on, on the flow of sports. And the best, the best way to, to describe the flow state is um, all, your, your, all of the participants here are basketball coaches. At one point or another, they've played basketball. Have you guys ever had a game where in everything that you threw up, no matter what you did, it just seemed to go in? And don't you wish that you could just bottle that and put that, but you can't. So the flow state, that's a state that everybody wants to get to, but they can't just get there. It has to happen. So the most, the most that you can do is prepare yourself to be in a good position to receive the flow state should it happen. So this can be anything from driving the car, the, the video games and being able to perform at a high level. And, and, and any other activity that, that you do. But uh, I guess for sports, that would be it. Like everything you throw up, it goes in. Yeah. Yes. In the zone. What's that? Yeah. Well, like uh oh. I think Coach Ariel is saying in the zone, when a player's in the zone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In the zone. In the zone. And, and all those things. And when you're in the zone, you're noticing what's going on uh, uh, a little bit more of where you are. You know, the recent statistic is that 40 of our own lives, we are not in the moment 40 to 50% of the time, right? We are thinking about what happened yesterday or what could happen tomorrow. So be, you know, doing these exercises helps you stay in the moment. It's the same thing as well too. When you tell your player to make 10 free throws, they make nine in a row and then they miss the 10th one. It always happens. They missed the 10th one because now they're saying things like, oh, I just got to make this last one. Oh, I just got one more shot. You know, oh, I can't wait till I make this because I'm going to show you. All these things are disrupting their flow in the mid part of it. So I tell a lot of our players, when you go in the gym, um, whether you put music on, tell someone not to bother you for five minutes and do some ball handling, do some shooting. You will know when you're in the zone when you're making five shots in a row, three shots in a row, 10 shots in a row. That's when you're in the you're in the flow part, so then you're you're ready to go with that. Hopefully that helps everybody. All right, trigger words. A Q word. This is huge. It's the last part of it. Trigger words are something that uh, we use to get you moving in a different direction. So if you're playing not very well um, and you have to have a word that's going to clear your mind and then everything is gonna start getting better. Not to say that it will, but a trigger word is a cue, something for you that can do it. So right here in this picture is a real story. 
um, well, all my stories are real, but this actually really happened. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm sorry guys, I'm, I'm gonna curse again for just like a little bit off this one. All right, so this is my player, Lexi Brown, who now plays in the WNBA and also plays uh, in Turkey in the professional leagues. Her dad is D Brown. You may not, I don't know if you remember D Brown. He won the dunk contest with the Boss Celtics 6-1. He's now the assistant GM of the LA Clippers. So this is her hand. Uh, when I was at Duke, I would do the pregame talks um, and I would call them gratitude talks, meaning I would take a look at a stat sheet and I would go deeper in the stat sheet. I would say, okay, well, player A, you did a great job. You took three, you had three great screens or you had two great offensive rebounds or I saw you had a great pass. All the things that don't show up on the stat sheet, that's what I talked about. So we were playing a game and I said, today, ladies, we have to mess with their heads. We have to get in their heads. So we have to go ahead and fuck with them for 40. I apologize. I know I said it bad. Fuck with them for 40. So she wrote down on her shoe, F-W-T-F-F. All right. Fuck with them for 40. And the 40 means the 40 minutes in a game. So she wrote down. She wrote it down. And then another player wrote it down on her shoes. And then another player wrote on her shoes. And then ESPN, the TV network, comes to me and says, Coach, what does that mean? I said, I can't tell you because there's too many bad words in it. But the point is, they wrote it down on their shoes. And then what happened, they started saying it in the huddles, at halftime, in timeouts, and during the game. They use that as their trigger word to play very inspired and motivated. Now, how does that work with you? So a lot of our teams, we have like this one word in the beginning of the year, whether it's family, team, tribe, hustle, championship, whatever else it is. That's your, that, that's your word of, of the year, and we use it for the length of the year. So sometimes when we say this, our players get in that moment, and they're like, oh, yeah, this is why we have to do this. Great. But your trigger word also comes down to who you are. So let's say you have a player, and every player, every, your team should have a trigger word as a team that the team comes up with by themselves. But your players, each individual should have their own trigger word as well too so an example let's say your player loves pandas all right loves pandas i know that's weird but loves pandas so their word would be panda so when they start off the game and they're not playing well you know when they come off the court you're telling them in their ear and not necessarily you as the coach you would like your players to be more involved they're saying, hey, Panda, but they miss a shot. Hey, Panda. Again, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I've had players like this. What that does, that triggers you. That, what that tells you, that gets calm and gets you into the moments so that you can go ahead and remember how to clear your mind and how to get there. I think I have a clip here on a, on a golf movie and you have to listen very carefully toward the end because it's kind of hard to hear. Let's see if it plays. From the greatest game ever played, the movie. Oh, look at that excitement. 
Now, okay, some of you may have missed the trigger word. Um, it was read it, roll it, pull it. Read it, roll it, pull it. Now that little kid said it to him, um, which was important because earlier in the movie, earlier in the film, that's what a coach kept telling him on how to ease yourself. So what that happened is the character, uh, Tobey Maguire was, not, that's not Tobey Maguire, Shia Labou was in The Golfer and was very nervous. And at that moment, what are you going to say that is going to calm the player's nerves? For some of us, we'll say something fundamental like in basketball, follow through, bend your legs, you know, protect the ball, all those different things. We are giving instruction, but what we're not giving, we're not giving them things that will actually calm their mind. We're actually giving things for them to think something more. So having a saying, having a trigger word, and in this situation, it was read it, roll it, and hold it. It calmed Shia LaBeouf down, and he made it. Now, it has happened in different situations uh, for, for different athletes. I have, a, as I mentioned earlier, I coach the New Zealand Junior National Team. So I have players uh, who are anywhere from 17 to, to 19 years old um, with it. So their minds aren't fully developed. So we actually have, and we don't have a lot of practice time, but over the course of a week of training camp, we start formulating what are our words that are gonna calm us down. And it could be anything from maybe it's a dance move, whether it's a word, anything at all, so then to calm down so then they could perform at the level you need to. Now, all of this stuff, I'm not saying that they're gonna start you know, scoring 30 points per game. What you're doing is that you are formulating the player for what we call the long game, the long term, so that now your whole team rises up over time. So when you're looking at your team, when you're trying to see on how you're going to make them better, how are you instilling trigger words? Now, again, you don't have to do all three of these, right? Or four, excuse me. You don't have to do mind mapping, meditation, visualization, and trigger words all together. You could pick one that you believe could work, or you could pick one for your team and then focus on that part and then have that almost as a, a team motto or trigger word or cue or something in order for them to play better. All right, so this is again what trigger words are right here. So you have it, you know, it, the trigger words, if you look at the top, it gives comfort and confidence. It puts them in a positive mood. And it also serves as a distraction of the anxiety of the pressure that is happening be, uh, around them. Below are sort of how, what you want it to look like. You got to make it your own. So each player has to have their own. Your team has to have their own. It's, it's their mantra. It's what they believe in. Um, make it short, you know, obviously read it, roll it and hold it is a little long, but if that's what makes it work, then that will work. And then the last part of work, of course, it being positive so they could go ahead and use it any time. And that's all I got for you guys. Uh, if you have any questions, love it. This is all my contact information. Uh, I think as, as coaches, uh, I have to be honest, I don't spend a lot of time on the X's and O's part. Uh, actually when I was, we were, had training camp for our New Zealand team, my assistant coaches came to me and said, all right, coach, what are we doing for practice? We do, we have a great out of bounds play that we're going to use. And I said, well, we're going to do out of bounds on Wednesday. And this was Monday. So I said, we'll do out of bounds plays on Wednesday. She said, okay, great. So Wednesday comes along and she comes up and says, coach, all right, what kind of great out of bounds plays is it? Did you get one from when you were at Duke? Did you get an out of bounds play when you were at the, you know, learn from the Celtics or, or any other place? I was like, no, I actually was on YouTube 10 minutes ago and I pulled the two best out of bounds plays that I liked. You know, that's how I think not all coaches should do. But I think if we think progressively, if we calm ourselves down and we spend and maybe one, two, five more minutes on the mental part of it, you're going to see your team really, really expand. But then I challenge you as the coach, because you have one mental session on Monday, doesn't mean everything changes. If you do it twice a week, once a week, three times a week, maybe every day, whatever time you put into it, you will keep growing it like Legos, like little building blocks over time. But if we're not consistent with it, then your players won't be consistent with it. If we go ahead and tell our players to take all these jump shots so they can be a better shooter, and we don't go ahead and work on some of the things that we that could help us culturally 
and on our mind and everything else. And guys, it's not going to work. And then you're going to be like, oh, that H guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So try and implement it. You know, you could email me at any time, h at hernandoplanels.com. Um, you could email me or you could DM me on different social medias and, and I'd be happy to, to share with all of it. But I truly believe it could be a big part of your program and how it changes the culture of what you do. So there's a question. Uh, is it ideal for the assistant coach to be the lead in mind mapping or should it should be the head coach? That's the main proponent. Yeah, so it's always good to delegate. It's always good to have your assistant coaches involved. And I think another voice is important. So if you're a head coach and you're always talking, then I would you know, suggest that you have an assistant coach um, really make that their kind of space. Make, so whether it's whatever, it's mind mapping or anything else, assign an assistant coach for that to do that. Because the players, if you're a head coach, the players get tired of hearing you over and over again. Um, so, so it's probably better to have someone else do it. Coach, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, with your experience in New Zealand and Duke, could you give us five qualities that the coach should possess in order to be successful? Yeah, so, so a, a few things. I think the five things would be, I think, number one, you have to have a, a growth mindset. You know, how are you improving every day? Um, how are you growing uh, your mind uh, for the game on and off the court? That's, that's a really huge part. Um, the second would be the ability to communicate and connect. Okay, how are you connecting with your players how are you communicating with your players okay i want you to think about one thing well a lot of things but there's something called the angry parent syndrome and we all had it when we were growing up whoever is your parent or guardian or lola lolo comes in in the house after Thank a long you. day you see when they're mad so when you see that they're mad you're going to be very conservative if they walk in very, very happy full of joy, full of energy and excitement, then you will have that same thing. So that's a great way to connect with your players, understanding how they are and how they behave. Um, the other part of it is empathy, having a great understanding of being in their shoes and what are the daily trials and tribulations they go through on an everyday basis. Um, Decision-making. Decision-making is huge. And when I say decision-making, it's not about being right or wrong, or this was a right decision, or wrong decision. It's actually making the decision, which science says that most of us don't even make a decision. So when we don't make a decision, what happens? Our life stalls and our players stall. And, and the last thing, which is the important thing for everything, you got to love. You got to love your players. You got to love what you do. You have to want to love the connection. You want to love the growth that happens. Coaching can be so frustrating. Right? You just want to, if I had hair, I'd pull all my hair out when I was coaching, but I don't. I was lucky. Instead, I just ate ice cream all the time, and that's bad. But the more you love, the more you love yourself, the more you love your players, you will see all these things start happening organically and naturally, and your team will get better. Your experience will get better. Um, wins can increase, um, but you as a coach have to gauge that on how much love you're going to show and give over the course of the year. Thanks so much, Coach H. No, it's great. Um, hopefully, I, I helped everybody um, with it. I have something to add for the, you know, whether they do uh, use trigger words or uh, mind mapping or visualization or meditation. It's very important that all levels of a team buy in. So, of course, you know, the players, the people immediately think about the players. But I, I, if, we, if we have a totem pole, the players are, are the last ones who are going to buy in because management, the coaches, everyone, the players will, are very smart. They'll see through it if a person's uh, just trying to implement something that they don't believe in. So the buy-in is very important. Yeah. No, Ab, Ab, what Teddy's saying is, is absolutely correct. So when you are putting your coaching plan together, you, it is, I encourage you to have a list of the players who are bought in, who are the players who aren't bought in, who are the players that could speak that, you know, basically echoes what you say um, as, as a head coach or an assistant coach, and then head coaches. 
you have to watch out for your assistant coaches. You have to see, are they on board? Are they not on board? That is a, a big, big part um, of being a head coach. You know, as a head coach, you're managing the whole thing. As an assistant coach, you are serving your head coach. How are you serving your head coach? Um, and then as well, too, Ted, you're talking about management. Yeah, you know, when you're dealing with management, you, you've got to make a strong case of why we are doing this because you know as well as I do, your players, if they don't agree with you, they're running to management and they're going to go and complain to management. So have that connection. We talk about communication and connection. Have that with management and grow that so that it becomes stronger. So when a player does come, now you have open lines of communication. I've seen too many coaches have a very broken relationship with their manager. And that's when ego gets in the way. We, we can't. We have to open up ourselves there. Right, what can we do to improve, to get better, um, and, and to work as a unit, as a team? I, I completely agree. Well, great. So, excellent, uh, participants, excellent. any other questions that you'd guys like to ask? You know, we don't have Coach H every day. So, send us some of your questions. So, what's next for the uh, youth team of New Zealand, what's next? Uh, yeah, well, obviously, we were we're not doing. Be, just, it, it, the crazy thing, so we were actually supposed to be in China for the Four Nations tournament um, mm. for 10 days starting next Saturday, but of course that's not happening. So that was going to be our, uh, our tournament to kind of prepare for the Asia Championships. So right now, because New Zealand is what they call like in level three, um, you know, obviously no one can go out, one person at the market. It's going to go down to level two, which you can start having going outside more, and it's got to get to the level one. Probably the biggest concern in New Zealand is that they're doing 15 days quarantine. So if I go, I have to be there 15 days beforehand <laughs> and, then, and then do training camp for maybe three days, four days, because we only have three or four days preparation, and then we will fly to, I think it's in Bangkok this year. It's supposed to be in Bangkok, the Asia, the under 18 Asia championships. And hopefully we finish top four and then we'll compete in the world championship next year. But we'll see. FIBA Asia hasn't made a decision. FIBA Europe has. FIBA Europe shut down a lot of stuff. Uh, FIBA Asia has not. They've not canceled that yet. So I'm, I'm hoping we, we play and we do. But in the meantime, I do uh, Zoom phone calls with them. We're yeah. going to start doing Zoom calls with them every week. Um, I have my coaches. They have their own players they're working with as well, too. And we're going to try and build that culture um, over time um, by not being around each other. And because I'm also 9,000 miles away. So it's a, it's a huge honor to do it. And, and, uh, and maybe one day I will then also help the Philippines national team come back home. That's what I want to do. Uh, we'd love to have you, of course. Uh, and uh, with your experience, of course, uh, uh, you'll definitely uh, be very helpful to our national team. So any parting words, Teddy, for you? Uh, I, 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 last question. I, I, learned, uh, I learned a lot from Coach H. Uh, I look forward to hearing his podcast. I see it's... Uh... Coach, can you tell us a little bit about your podcast before we go? Yeah, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. It's, it's called the Be Contagious Leadership Experience. I have season one is out. That's about 21 episodes. Um, season two is about to come out uh, over the next week, and that's going to be about 12 episodes. You can find it on iTunes, on Spotify, on Google, on, on anything, really, um, you'll be able to. And, and a lot of them, the first season are a lot of coaches on how they build their culture and how they coach their teams. Um, season two is a, now more some entrepreneurs, some coaches, um, some mental coaches as well, too. So kind of like a bit of everything with it. And, and, and it is really, it's like, how can we be better leaders um, in our own personal life, in our public life, um, and, our, and, our, and on our relationships as well, too. But no, this, is, this has been great. I appreciate um, everything with it. I mean, to be on here, it's, it's a huge honor. I, I have to say this real quickly. You know, I grew up in Los Angeles and my father is from Spain and my mom is from the Philippines. And um, my father was 50 years old, so he didn't really talk to me. So I spent a lot of time with my mom. So I grew up, you know, eating, 
you know, all lumpia, pancet, adobo, everything. Like I mentioned earlier, I know all the bad words. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what's that? You sound horrible. Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Again? Sorry, you, George. You, at one point, you sound like Jokoi. If you talk, yes. you're, you're talking well, about your mom. I shaved, yeah, she, and she still does it. This is what my mom says to me to this day. She, she'll call me and she'll say, Junior? I'm like, yes. She goes, See? Mom, are you still a coach? I'm like, yeah. She goes, well, you sh are you a head coach? I'm like, no, Mom, I'm still an assistant. She goes, ah, Junior, you should have been a nurse. I told you to be a nurse, Junior. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. No, no, I, I don't. Uh, so so there's, there's all these things. So I'll be... You know, I, 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 so I grew up on that side. I went to all the different events and I went to the Philippines the first time when I was 13, 14 years old. And it was actually the first time I found out that my mom had other kids. So when I would go to the Philippines, I've been to the Philippines now four times. Um, when I came to work at UE, when I came to visit, like it's honestly, it's, I go to the Philippines, I feel like I'm actually at home. Um, and when you grow up being, you know, half one culture, half another, you, you are lost in many ways. Um, so, you know, obviously, Coach, you know, meeting you um, that we did years ago and my experiences, it's something that I've, I've always um, loved and to, to, to want to continue to grow. So I'm always here to help. Um, I was excited and honored to be on this. Um, obviously, anything I could do to help any of you, um, please, you have all my email. I think there are a couple more questions people had, but it, anything I could help you with culture, buy-in, um, anything at all, uh, I'd be more than happy to help and want to see you succeed um, in everything uh, that you do. I have a website, HernandoPlanels.com. You can visit that. Again, all the social media, the podcast and everything. And we're all in this together. And we're going to get through all this COVID. And, it, and it's going to be a little different. It's going to be okay. Thank you so much, Coach. We're uh, honored to have you. And uh, uh, hopefully we can invite you again for uh, Any another, another session in the future. Anytime. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, um, Coach. Uh, attendees, uh, stay a little bit. Uh, you know, um, I would like to thank again Blackwater Elite for uh, sponsoring us and, of course, Hoop Coaches International. Again, uh, we have some uh, boards to give away. We're going to be um, uh, posting uh, those uh, attendees that are deserving to get them, and we will have some that uh, will be up for auction those signed by our PBA head coaches. Uh, the proceeds will go to the Pasig General Hospital uh, frontliners. So if you have anything also, uh, other coaches, you have anything to share with our fellow coaches, just feel free to message us at Hoop Coaches International. Again, thank you so much, Coach and uh, Teddy, for joining us. And uh, we'll have a last, our last session in about uh, 30 more minutes with Coach uh, Martin Bahar, so he's going to talk about uh, uh, related to the topic earlier, which is the ball screen motion, but uh, some counters and how the uh, teams in the U.S. runs it. Again, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for staying, and we'll see you again. Right.